Hello everybody and welcome to the next video on my intro to linguistics. Um, today we are dealing with semantics. So in semantics we are dealing with the meaning behind words as we can for example find it in dictionaries. So first let's talk about important key terms in semantics. First we have semasiology where we go from the word to the meaning so my example question here is what does prevaricate mean a word that i guess most of you haven't heard yet and that's really rare the counter concept is onomasiology where we go from the concept to a word and here we can see what is the word for avoid telling the truth it's prevaricate. So I chose this example to show you both sides. Next, we've got the denotation, which is the descriptive dictionary meaning, which is objective. So it's not subjective, it's just the definition that counts, that doesn't include any associations whatsoever that you make with the word. And here we have prevaricate, verb, avoid telling the truth. Then we have the connotation, which are the associations excluded in the denotation. And they are often culture specific or subjective based on your own experiences. And I, this is just a few things that popped up to prevaricate, not necessarily my own opinion, but just things I could imagine people thinking when they hear the word. So it could be that somebody thinks of white lies, that somebody thinks of dishonesty, that somebody thinks of it as a necessary evil, and so on and so forth. And last but not least, we have the reference, which is a specific object in our world, so in our extra-linguistic reality, that certain words refer to. Prevaricate wasn't a good example anymore, so I skipped to island. And for islands, we have for example, Ibiza, Sky, Hispaniola, Bali, any island you can think of is a reference for island. Now let's, let's go into structural semantics and let's focus on semantic relations first. Synonymy is a very common concept that I guess most of you have already heard. And we have partial and total synonymy. Total synonymy means that a word is interchangeable in any context you can imagine and that is a utopia it doesn't exist because why would we have two words for the exact same thing that's not economical either but what is very common is partial or descriptive synonymy where we have very closely related meanings but there is some small difference for example in register we have indict and accuse of when, where we could say in a casual conversation that we accuse somebody of doing something, we wouldn't say somebody is indicted. That is a much more formal and mostly judicial term. Or we have regional variation where we say the tap, or we'll call the, the thing the water comes out the tap. In British English, we call it the faucet in American English. Of course, this is not 100% absolute, but it's a tendency. And then we have different collocations. For example, we can say somebody has strong arms, but we wouldn't ever say somebody has powerful arms. Another semantic relation that we have to talk about is antonymy, antonymy not so easy to pronounce. Um, and antonymy refers to polar and gradable words. So not absolutes, but they are gradable. And in this example here, we have hot and cold. They are polar, but they are not absolute. So something can be hot, but something else can be hot too, just a little hotter or a little colder. So it's, it's, a, it's variable. And that's what makes it gradable. We also have complementarity as another type of opposition. And here we have absolutes. This is an either or relationship and what I chose as an example is pass or fail 
because when you fail a test, you didn't pass it. And when you pass it, you didn't fail it. There is no way you can gradually pass fail a test that doesn't happen. Then we have relational opposition, another type of opposition, where one thing is looked, looked at from a different point of view. In this case, we have the marriage with the husband and the wife as relational opposites. Another type of opposition is directional opposition, where the name says it, it's, it's just a change in direction. So we have here left and right as just two very basic concepts. A totally different type of semantic relation is hyponymy. In hyponymy, we have a hierarchical structure. So we have a general term at the top and then more specific terms that belong to the group on the bottom. And the generic term is called hyperonym. In this case, it's a dog. And then we have the hyponyms, which are the more specific terms. Here we have a Labrador, a poodle, a pug, a Dalmatian. And several of these hyponyms together can also be called heteronyms or co-hyponyms if you want to make your life easy. A similar concept, but not the same, is mironymy, where we have one word that comprises many things, which is the holonym, and the parts of the holonym are referred refer to as the mironyms. Here we have the body, and the mironyms of the body would be the head, arms, legs, back, all the body parts you can imagine. Staying with structural semantics, now we go to, on to lexical ambiguity because it's not always easy to deal with words. First thing we have to talk about is polysemy. Polysemy means that we have single forms of a word with different but related meanings. So here we have the mouse. A mouse can either be an animal or the computer mouse, and we can see the relation between these two words. So they also have some kind of common etymology. Whereas in homonymy, the lexemes look and sound the same, but there is no related meaning, at least synchronically, whatsoever. They just happen to have the same form. So here we have rock and rock. Rock music doesn't have anything to do with the rock you find in the mountains. Another type is homography, where two lexemes are identical in spelling. Here we have the bear as the animal, bear, and the verb bear as in support or carry. So this is just about spelling, but we can also have identical pronunciation, which is then called homophony. Here is the example of write, which can either be write when you write with a pen or the direction write. And just a little Easter egg for, for those of you out there who um, speak American English or are interested in that. In American English, we have another hom um, homophone due to the flapped T. We have Adam, represented by the apple here, and Adam, as in atom, with a T. And Adam, of course, as the name Adam. Structural semantics still are a topic, and this time we go to syntagmatic terms. First thing we have to address here is collocations. Collocations are words that occur together frequently, and the native speaker would notice if you mix up your collocations. So if you use, for example, powerful arms, which we had before, that just sounds strange to a native speaker. And here we have examples of collocations, we have heaven and hell, represented by a cloud and this devil, devil face. Then we have salt and pepper, a very common collocation. And when you say that a shop closes, they go out of business. You cannot say they leave business. That would sound, well, you can, you can certainly say it, but to a native speaker, it would sound odd if you said it like that. So the collocation is to go out of business. 
Another syntagmatic relation is an, uh, our idioms, which are fixed terms that are semantically non-transparent -tra if you don't know them. So if you don't know what they mean, they normally don't really make sense to you. The most prominent example is shown by to kick the bucket. And on the bottom, you can see to go out of hand. And on the right, under the weather. So to kick the bucket means to die, which is not really transparent if you don't know that it means that. To go out of hand means that something turns into chaos or loses its order. And to be under the weather means that you're feeling a little sick. And we're still with structural semantics. This time we're talking about componential an analysis, which is a semantic way of analyzing words. So we have the meaning of a word, which is represented as a bundle of semantic features, also called simeme. And the simeme is put together from seams, which are distinctive features of that meaning. Or in other words, an, a certain property of the word that sets it apart from others. So here I have animals starting with the letter C as my group and the four properties or features mammal, four legs, pets and can fly. Of course pet is highly subjective, I meant classical pet here, or pet in the real traditional sense. So we can see that for example the catfish is not a mammal, doesn't have four legs, is not a classic pet, and cannot fly. Whereas the cat is a mammal, has four legs, and is a classical pet, but it can't fly either. However, the canary bird can. So the canary bird is set apart from the cat, and in fact, all of the others in this list here, by the distinctive feature of can fly. And for example, the simim of the chimp would be it is a mammal, so plus mammal. It has four legs, plus four legs. It's not a pet, minus pet, and cannot fly, so minus can fly. This plus and minus is also the way you note that down together with the respective feature. Now we're leaving this area and go to cognitive semantics and I want to present to you the newer way of analyzing meanings of words, which is prototype semantics. And in prototype semantics, we have a prototype. So as it says up here, think of a tool. What is the first one that comes to your mind? That is your prototype of a tool. Most people mention a hammer. I didn't, I think, when I first was asked the question. But um, yeah, so you have this one thing that represents the group best to you, which is the prototype. And we describe the categories by attributes, not features, because features are a rather rigid concept and the co uh, componential analysis is quickly brought to its, to its limits when things get too rigid. So um, we need something more flexible. That's why we use attributes. And basically, prototype analysis means that you compare everything to your prototype. And the prototype as a reference point then determines if another member or another thing that could be a tool is a prototypical member, so something very strongly related to your prototype, or a marginal mem member. So it is a tool, yes, but it's it's something very different than your prototype or no member at all. Another field in cognitive semantics and a very important one are metaphors and autonomies. So metaphors, um, all of you have certainly heard about metaphors in school. A metaphor means that we transfer the meaning of the words from a source domain which is usually something concrete, something that we can deal with easily in our minds, to a usually more abstract target domain. For example, feelings, 
And most interestingly, computers are both a common source and target domain because we talk about our minds to show what we mean in computers and also vice versa. It's a very interesting thing. But usually it's very clear how source and target domains are set apart because target domains usually are more abstract. And the connection between the source and the target domain is made by similarity. So, for example, we have the first metaphor here when you have an ace up, an ace up your sleeve and you have something hidden that you can still bring onto the table to turn uh, to turn the tables around again metaphor um, to um, make your own fortune better and um, that obviously comes from card playing so we can see game and games and fortune can be linked together it's a similar story but a more historical connection with the walk to canossa when you do a walk of canossa you do something really big to apologize you really you mean it like emperor i think it was henry the fourth not emperor oh yes german emperor um who uh walked to canossa to apologize to the pope so it was a big thing and then we have to get cold feet when you get scared and abandon a plan or an undertaking which again comes from card playing because, or from poker playing more precisely because people said they get cold feet and left, um, left the room. Um, yeah, so you can see it's always somehow linked by a certain similarity between the situations. But yeah, um, there are lectures on that. It's a really big topic and sometimes a little hard to explain which you can see by the fact that there is a whole lecture on it. Metonymy is a similar concept to a metaphor, but here the connection is not based on the similarity between two domains, but on a certain contiguity. So we don't transfer the meaning, but we rather have a stand for relationship. So one thing stands for something else. For example, when we say Fleet Street says, we mean that the media or the press says and that comes from the fact that uh, Fleet Street used to be the place where all of London's press headquarters used to be. So the place Fleet Street stands for British press or London press. If I say I read a lot of Shakespeare I, of, I, I naturally mean I read the books by William Shakespeare. I don't read him himself, but the author in this case stands for his works. And if you own a Picasso, you naturally do not own Pablo Picasso, but a picture he painted. So again, it's the artist who stands for his works. And with that, we've made it to the end of our semantics video. I hope you understand it a little better now. and. I look forward to seeing you in the next week for Pragmatics.